Well, uh, thank you very much, John Henry, for inviting me. And thank you all for uh, listening. Um, uh, and what a barnstorming day. Thank you, John Henry, for organising it all. And um, thank you for all our speakers, especially, of course, Bishop Strickland and uh, Cardinal Muller, but also that one barnstorming speech from Michael Matt. Mike's not here at the moment, but uh, he knows what I think. Uh, that was fantastic. It's great. <laughs> I'm... Uh, uh, a trial attorney, what we call a barrister in London. Um, I'm, <coughs> I, uh, I'm also a pro-life lawyer. I do quite a lot of rather depressing uh, uh, end-of-life euthanasia cases. Depressing, why? Well, because we lose most of the time, and that means that somebody dies. Um, but we have to keep fighting the good fight, and I think it's a very good uh, training ground for the kind of fight that we're fighting here within the church, which is um, also sometimes depressing, but one that we mustn't ever give up on, as we've heard from our speakers today. I was former president of the Univoce International Federation. As you know, that's the international organization defending the traditional Roman right of the mass. I'm still chairman of the Catholic Union Charitable Trust in the UK. Uh, I do a bit of writing from time to time. And this all results from my having converted many years ago from the Church of England. So what I've seen in the Church of England is uh, something similar to what is now happening in the Catholic Church. And what we're witnessing is a direct infiltration of the Church by an alien spirit at the highest levels. Sadly, at the highest levels. And although the Church, as we well know, can never be defeated, nonetheless, evil can cause a lot of confusion amongst the faithful. And most importantly, and we shouldn't forget this, loss of souls, because after all, the end of the day, uh, as Cardinal Mary Dalval put it, fake away all else, give me souls. It's the souls that matter. And that's what we're witnessing in our time. It's our duty to defend orthodoxy, just as did the great medieval English bishop Robert Grosstest, uh, who was Bishop of Lincoln when he was faced with evil at the highest levels of the church, uh, and as did St. Paul when he opposed St. Peter to his face. This synod on synodality, is, as uh, one of our speakers at the press conference said, it's not a synod. It's, it's certainly not an exercise of the authentic magisterium of the church, nor indeed of the magisterium at all. It is really, insofar as it calls itself a synod, a fraud. It's a failed attempt to emulate that clever device borrowed from Marxist political agitators in which the agenda, the meetings, the speeches and the eventual outcome are all carefully stage managed so as to achieve a prearranged and manipulated result. It's not a consultation of the faithful, it's not to do with truth, and it's not to do with the good of the church, but really manipulation and control. <clears throat> well, this kind of manipulation was tried in the Church of England. Although it succeeded in obtaining the manipulator's aims, lay control, women deacons, priestesses, and many other things, it failed dismally at the pastoral level because most Anglican churches, save those that have been taken over by Bible-believing evangelicals, most are virtually empty. So <clears throat> that's the, to my mind, the lesson of this kind of manipulation. It might succeed in the short term, but in the long term it means empty churches. And actually... Has it even really succeeded on its own terms? Well, as we've heard from Mike and from various other people, we don't know yet because it looks like a preparation for what's going to happen next year. But at the moment, it doesn't seem to have been successful even on its own terms. The participants quickly grew bored with the aimless and pointless round of discussions. Nothing has been completely decided and it looks just like four weeks of time wasting. But that won't stop the manipulators from continuing to try to impose error upon us faithful Catholics. So, but we've got to remember that the, the lesson is the synodal fraud leads only to empty churches. Uh, and indeed, in some ways, sad to say, that has been the theme of this pontificate. Um, the more that falsehood is imposed, the more people either leave the church altogether or, if they discover it in time, they start going to the traditional Roman rite of mass, which is where they will hear and imbibe the full Catholic faith, which is what the, one of the many reasons why we need to keep promoting the traditional Roman rite. Uh, and as I think Mike said, ironically, in that respect, Pope Francis has been our best recruiting sergeant, <laughs> ironically. Uh, but the fact is, the more he favours and embraces people 
Well, let's be frank, perverts, paedophiles, clerical predators like uh, Father Marco Rupnik, or he seems to have done a bit of a U-turn on that one, the more the faithful will turn away. And, and, and in some respects, that's the, the real lesson of this synod, failed synod. Failed so far, but they're not going to give up. So what is the solution? Well, um, we're meant to be strategizing here, and I've had a, my own thoughts about this, and I'll share them with you for what they're worth. Uh, although, frankly, it comes better, I think, from some of our African colleagues. My own personal view is, having seen how things, uh, the faith seems to have been preserved in some respects better in, in, uh, in, in, in Africa, certainly better than in Europe. Uh, and uh, I, I can't make the comparison with America because in America you've had a lot of successes as well, a lot more than we've had, for example, than in Britain. But a lot of the African bishops are still loyal to Jesus Christ, to the church, to the faith. Um, it won't be long, of course, before they are under attack and before there is an attempt to replace them with more pliable, modernist, liberal and, frankly, heretical bishops. But at the moment, they're still good. And part of one of the suggestions I would make, for what it's worth, is that we ought to be in, engaging with them, dialoguing with them, helping them with information so far as we're able to do that, and in particular trying to ask them and encourage them to form a kind of block of bishops who are faithful. Because faithful bishops from Africa can carry a lot of weight here in Rome and in the Vatican. And if they come in large numbers and say, no, we're not going to have that, we are faithful to Christ and we're going to remain faithful to Christ. And if you're going to try and tell us not to, well, I'm sorry, we're not going to do that, like Bishop Robert Grostest of Lincoln. Now, there is a bit of a path already laid out in that respect. And ironically enough, it's in the Church of England, because that's what happened in the Church of England. A lot of African bishops, uh, and indeed bishops from other parts of the world, New Guinea, for example, said to Canterbury, to the Lambeth Conference, no, we're not having this. We are not going to have homosexual marriage. We're not going to have same-sex marriage. We in Africa don't believe in that. Uh, and in New Guinea, they, the bishops there even said, and if you're going to carry on trying to force that down us, we'll leave the Church of England and join the Catholic Church. And by the way, that's what the New Guinea bishops did. <laughs> so so there, is, there is a bit of a model there. Let's mobilize the African bishops. That's my if you like, headline suggestion um, for all of you. Thanks very much. Thank you.